Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of Happy Being Well. As usual, we have an exciting guest today. We have Karen Jubatsky. If I botched it up, she can correct it afterwards. Karen is a podcaster of Momnificent, and she has a wellness academy for parents so that they can better parent their children in wellness topics, personal development topics. She'll dive deep into that after. But before we dive deep with Karen, this podcast is sponsored by happybeingwell.com. All products so that you can live happy being well. So all organic self-care products such as 100% natural facial masks, bath soaps, natural essential oils, aromatherapy diffusers, creative and high quality active wear leggings and use code podcast 25 for 25% off all leggings. Free shipping in the USA. Always, always subscribe to Happy Being Well's email newsletter for 10% off all items, including free shipping in the USA. So Karen, welcome to the Happy Being Well podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here. So this is really cool that you are, first of all, I just want to say like, I wish like I had, I know that's not exactly what you offer because you're targeting parents, but I wish like I had like embarked on my personal development education, like really like at at a really been enmeshed into it, like, you know, maybe I would say maybe high school or maybe just kind of earlier elementary um, but I will say like, I was lucky though. I did have some amazing teachers in elementary school who, you know, I remember I had an element, I grew up Catholic, so I went to Catholic schools. Um, and so I did have an amazing teacher in elementary school that she actually would teach us meditation and she incorporated with, um, you know, religion, like she would not religion, I shouldn't say the word religion, but like, you know, kind of like visualize yourself sitting on a bench talking to Jesus. And I really, really so grateful for that, because that has always carried with me um, throughout my journey. And I think that was like, I was exposed to that, geez, I think like grade five, and or maybe grade six around there and that was such a beneficial you know thing for me to practice with her and I remember doing in the gym so I I I don't know back I think we had a teacher for like I think we were dedicated one teacher for like almost every subject or something I can't remember back in those days but for some reason we were in the gym so she must have like incorporated as a part of her yeah she did she incorporated as a part of the gym curriculum. Um, So anywho, I don't know why I'm going into that memory, but I think it's because this is what you do. You are basically teaching and guiding parents and how to instill mindfulness, wellness into their teens, which is so super, super vital. But I will say this, remember when I was taking personal development courses, um, I do remember like seeing like really like teens, um, or just graduating high school or on the cusp of graduating high school in these personal development programs. I mean, it was very rare, but amongst all these adults. And I remember looking at them like, man, they're going to have such a leg up. <laughs> right. Like, I'm like, I was like, geez, I, if I had done this when I was in high school, oh my goodness. Like I, you know, it really does give you the leg up and teaches you how to master your emotions, be more um, aware of your emotions and such. So anywho, how did you get into this? So I um, have been a principal now for, this is my sixth year, and I was an assistant principal for five years before that. And pre-COVID, my psychologist, my educational diagnostician, just pure observation on my part, I was seeing these kids coming with more and more mental health needs. And we were all looking at each other like, what do we do? We are not the experts in this area. And yet we're facing the problems every day. And parents and teachers are looking to us for the solution. And it was really, that was that was such a hard place to be. There's nothing like facing a problem or issue at school with a child and not having the answer for your teachers, for your staff, for myself, 
to help that child. And so watching this day after day, experiencing it week after week, month after month, my school counselor came to me one day and shared that a school nearby had a mindfulness coach that was doing lessons with the kids on mindfulness. And I was like, what, what is that? All right, tell me more. And she was like, Karin, we have to bring this coach into our school. And I was like, okay, fine. Like you are obviously so convinced of this. Her daughter was, was in that school uh, at the time. So we uh, brought this mindfulness coach in just to pilot it in our first grade. And I mean, teachers were like, what are we doing? What is this? And I was like, you don't have to do anything. You just have to be in the room and just participate with whatever she's leading. Well, this coach uh, was, had taken her training from mindfulschools.org that has classes online. So one of my teachers took the first class and she was like, Karin, you have to take this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Whatever. I didn't even pursue it at the time. So after eight weeks of these first graders getting these lessons, all of a sudden the teachers who were like, what is this? were coming to me saying that they were using the practices and tools she taught, not only for themselves, but at home, even with their own kids. I mean, they had like done a complete 180 and I'm just watching all of this. And then we had parents contacting me saying, you know, my kid asked me if I was okay today. And when I said why, they were like, well, mom, you know, you look like you just need to take a deep breath. Can I show you the ball breath that I learned at school today? I mean, you can't even get kids to tell you what they learned in school that day. And here they were offering information with this mindfulness. And mm -hmm. so fast forward, we ended up getting our entire school the following year every grade, every class, getting these eight weeks, it's just 15 minutes once a week. I ended up taking two courses through mindful schools, learning the lessons and started teaching them myself with the kids. One of the fifth graders started a YouTube channel, mindfulness with Dr. J. And I would throw videos on there. He would take videos of me with the kids. So we could show parents what we were doing because it's such a buzzword that people are like, Ooh, mindfulness, but nobody really knows what we're doing, you know? And then you have it, naturally, it could feel like, are you making them sit cross-legged and like hum with, you know, holding their fingers like this and the room's dark. Like we all have our own story. And if you don't tell the story of what it is, we make up and come to the table with our own thoughts and preconceived notions of what that is. And then it wasn't until we had done that for about a year that, um, well, the, the coach did a pre and post data collection from our second through fifth graders. And like 40% of the kids said those mindfulness practices we're helping them sleep better at night. Like 80% thought this should be taught to other kids. 70% said they were using it at home, teaching their sibling. And all of a sudden, when I saw that data, my eyes just got so wide because here I was begging the state, the district to bring more mental health resources in. And I'm at a very affluent school that doesn't always get the resources that some money comes to for the title one inner city schools, but we have kids with the same problems. Okay. It's episodic and it might not be, you know, 95%, but we've got them. And what do we do with them? And to me, this, these mindfulness lessons was like a proactive therapeutic approach to give kids the tools needed so that when they face difficult situations or one kid in fifth grade, even got on a video with me sharing my mom got, I wanted my mom to help me with something over the weekend and she was helping my older brother and I was so frustrated. I wanted her to help me now. And I remembered to take a mindful moment, take my deep breaths. And all of a sudden I was like, it's okay. And when my mom's ready, she will help me. That is incredible for kids to learn. And like you were saying, made me reflect on, gosh, I wish I had this as a kid, how much, you know, anxiety could I have just lessened knowing that I had access to a certain breath to help me get calm and in control of my feelings and emotions again. And so I have committed to creating videos for sale for parents to use with their kids and or teachers. Um, and then, so that's the whole mindfulness piece. And then we'll get into the, the collaborative problem solving piece that I work with parents on in, in a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, anxiety is huge. I, I, this was anxiety was never talked about when I was in school, you know, not even like, not even in high school, like, you know, definitely not elementary school. And I think what, you know, and what happens is, you know, we don't recognize we're experiencing anxiety. So especially as a teenager, um, it gets redirected over, you know, you deal with it and you're, you're operating on a subconscious 
your sub subconsciously and you know I remember you know you could in the 90s smoking was cool and I was like going to high school like in the 90s and I remember like smoking cigarettes and thinking that was cool with the cool kids right and um but I mean that may have to do with the culture at the time like that's being paraded you know in front I remember that was kind of like paraded in front of us um you know so but the thing is why why are the kids going towards things like that because it, that's another avenue to deal with anxiety and uh, plus there's peer pressure so I think like if it was talked about like this is what anxiety is this is how it shows up in your body and it is like a very normal human reaction to feel anxiety when you are you know, feeling pressure, whether academically or it's peer pressure or whatever it is. I think that if we were taught at an early age, because I didn't even recognize anxiety until I was like an adult until like, um, you know, you know, you know, when I was experiencing it to be more cognizant of it, um, because, you know, I, I remember I would, after high school, then I immediately went into university and just, you're just, you're just so caught up in the next, you know, thing that you have to achieve, 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 and, you know, what to do after we're f finishing your school activities. It's, you're just so caught up with like, what's the cool thing to do? Okay. What do I have to do next? I just remember being so, so busy with the to-do list um, that, you don't even think about what's how you're functioning if you're functioning you know a healthy in terms of how you're dealing with catching up with your to-do list and your studies so yeah but I do remember I would you know take it upon myself but this because it was just always my natural inclination to sign up for meditation classes, um, you know, all throughout my university journey, do sign up for yoga, go to the gym. I would do those things, but it was just never really heavily talked about as a collective conscious. It was more like I was subscribing to those activities, right? There was certain, it was like a little, um, I would say niche groups that would like individually, sporadically, um, you know, it was, it was just, it, I would say that it was like dabbling, you know, you're, I was like dabbling, you know, through wellness, um, throughout the university years by, you know, taking a little, I can't remember, it was just like a little, oh, you know, walk in where oh, we're having this like Buddhist meditation, we're gonna talk about Buddhism, and we're gonna meditate and discuss, like a little, but it was like, not an ongoing thing, or just like little things you can sign up for. So, but I think that this is so, so needed. Um, so, but how did you just, you, you said that you're a principal. So I, I, how did you think of the idea though, to start doing this? Oh, uh, well, it was interesting because literally near that time that I ended up taking one of the courses. So the, the coach came in and taught the first grade and then my special ed teacher, took one of the courses online and she was like, Karn, you have to take one and the staff needs to take it. So I had her present to the staff about it. And I offered to pay for anybody, any staff member who wanted to take the first level course. And about six, six of us signed up, maybe four of us actually took it um, and myself. And then I ended up going further. And that at that time, I had been dabbling with some meditation. My husband had been meditating and I was just watching him from a distance and like dabbling with it. But but was, what was so fascinating for me was only when I would sit down and close my eyes and just be still and sit quietly, like literally, that's all I did. Did I notice that I actually could get to a place of pure calm inside that I, that nothing else had gotten me to, especially with all the weight and the stress and the pressure of being a principal. So many things weigh on your mind. Your thoughts are going wild. If a parent is upset, it's hard to get rid of that thought, that feeling that comes with it same with a, a, a teacher. And, the, and then the kids, I was telling you, kids going through things and not having the answer, carrying the weight of that. I mean, I exercised for years. I felt like fitness was my outlet, but I still never got rid of that inner, inner voice pressure, 
that was going on inside of me until I would sit and sit quietly and just give myself that stillness. And I, and the program would have you start with like five minutes and then you build up to seven minutes, 10 minutes, 11 minutes. And it was so powerful. I was experiencing the power of it. It was for myself. So then, I mean, when the mindfulness lady comes in, she te- teaches the kids about their senses. Like first, we're going to listen today and just notice what we listen. Her, what she taught the kids was just being aware of the present moment, using your senses, just noticing without judgment, what comes up for you. And so it's really tuning into those, your senses in being aware mindfully. Uh, and then she taught them breathing techniques that they could use to help calm their nervous system. I mean, you don't really say that to them, but you have them notice that when you need to take a minute, here's some, like a ball breath, a finger breath. I would even do it myself. One time my secretary walked into my office and I was sitting there doing the finger breath because the teacher just said something that completely just really got me upset. And I need to take a moment for myself to get myself on track, centered, whole, positive built up again to stand up and do the next thing that I needed to do and step into. And for, and it was, it's the very thing we taught these kids and even kids would get upset and ask to come to the principal's office and see me so that they, we could do our breaths together. Cause sometimes just doing it with someone just helps you get the power of it yourself to, to do it on your own. Um, so it was, it was kind of like a personal journey of mine that ended up kind of not even me bringing it up, but through another staff member bringing it up and then just learning more with it and teaching students. Um, so that's kind of how how it all happened. Mm, yeah, that makes sense because you were in the school and you, that was your place of employment and that was your personal journey. And so you married the two. So it completely makes sense. And also too, I would imagine that it would help reduce the amount of bullying that takes place in schools. Um, You know, because I remember I was bullied in school, right? And I was like the, and I was, if I can just like circle back in time and remember those kids that were the like bullies, they typically had, they were like, they did have a lot of, um, let me try to think, let me try to remember now, go back into the the time warp. they had, they definitely had a lot of energy. Um, typically they had a lot of energy. Um, they were like, obviously angry. I remember if I were to look back and try to remember, you know, their, their type of personality, how they would go about their day or how they were on the playground, um, very competitive and constantly judging. So there was a lot of like, you know, which obviously comes maybe from the home, the way the parents, but there's just that, you know, negative energy that they have, and they're just trying to kind of release it, right, to make themselves feel better, right? So a lot of like, self worth going on with these people that, you know, like to bully, right? So do you have you noticed, like, bullying go down as a result of, you know, these trainings on the kids? That's a good question. I, I don't know that uh, we don't have a lot of bullying at our school in general. So it, it was hard for us to really see if it, it what decreased it uh, or it, what the impact that had on it. Um, but but this is a beautiful segue. Is it okay if I go in and start talking about my collaborative problem solving process? Because this, yeah, sure. this is what I use there. So this is so beautiful. So about 12 years ago, Um, I went to a a training and a course from Dr. Stuart Ablon, and he taught us about this collaborative problem solving approach, which, for example, if I knew a kid was being mean or, or was angry or did something to bother another child, right? What, what this process includes is a very empathetic approach. So in my discipline and discipline like strategy if you will as as a behavior person in the school even when I was an assistant principal because that that's when all the kids were referred to me when they were bad I always kept an empathetic approach and and a tone of voice I teach this to parents it's called the elevator tone of voice it's like when you get on the elevator with someone you're like hey how are you hey have a great day yeah thanks that tone is how you will only talk to your child when they've done something wrong and think of the last time your kid did something and the tone of voice you used with them and compare it to this. 
And this is what I work with parents on, because if you use that empathetic elevator tone of voice with a kid, for example, I say to the kid, I heard you, you know, you were really mean on the playground and, and you said some really, really harsh words, you know, to the other student. And then you, you ask the question, what's up with that? And do you hear that tone in my voice? It's very non-assuming. It's not pointing down to them. It's not making, it's not belittling them or making them feel worse because they did something wrong. I never make a child feel worse than how they're coming to me because I, I actually was that kid when I was in elementary school, there were moments, a few, it's not like my entire elementary career. I, I lied. I stole, I cheated. I was like a bad kid and I felt bad and I hated that feeling. And to this day, I will never make a kid feel bad because I don't believe it's my job to make them feel worse. I believe inside them, they do have remorse, even if they don't always show it, which is hard for us as adults sometimes, because we want them to feel how bad you are, because usually it's because we're taking it personally, what they did. So going back to the approach, I'll say to the kid, like, you know, I noticed, or I heard that you X, Y, and Z, what's up with that? And you wait and kids aren't used to being asked that kind of a question. They're used to us saying, how could you do that? I didn't teach you that. You know better. I can't believe you did that. Don't you ever do that again. Da, 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 right. We want to just like take off mm -hmm. the right finger, go to the principal's office, you know, is what I get from. And, and all, all of that in that moment, that kid's not going to learn anything from it because they're freaked out. Their amygdala is totally like charged. They're not in a state of calm. Probably if you ask them their name, they probably couldn't even tell it to you. I mean, they are their whole system is just on alarm, fight, freeze, right? Or flee. So to get them to that calm state, you've got to wait till they calm down. And I give them that time, whatever it is, you sit there and when you're calm and in control of your body, then I will talk to you. And that's what I talk to parents about and teach them. Don't, I mean, it's not always the, the perfect situation to be able to do this in, but as many times as you can, don't talk to your kid till they are calm and in control of their body. And then use this elevator tone of voice, asking them, what's up with that? Because behind every behavior, there is a story. And this process gets to the story. And I would venture to say every kid that bullied you in school had something going on at a deeper level of a need or that was unmet. And if we could have gotten to that and helped them there, then we start changing the behavior of who kids are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, but do you find, because a lot of it usually, I mean, obviously probably stems from the home, like something that the parents are doing, maybe the parents are neglecting them or worse, maybe they're actually being abused, like, you know, maybe psychologically or physically or what have you. Um, do you find like if, you know, the parents take it personally, if, you know, if the child's misbehaving, like the automatically go into defense mode. Yeah. And it's so hard. Yes. And that's why I use this approach with parents. So I, with the parent, Hey, you know, your child admitted to this. And I, and I usually have to tell parents, your child is not a robot. And we really want them to be like perfect all the time. And we have this expectation that they should act a certain way. I trained you a certain way and they do take it personally. And it's so hard, but I work with the parents to help them see like the other day, a kid, um, a kid said to another kid on the playground, something really inappropriate. And I had to call the parent and she was like, oh my gosh, you know, it, it's the first week of school and I don't want them feeling bad. So when they come home, I'm going to be like, were you bad at school today? And I was like, you just said, you don't want them to feel bad. Don't use that phrase with them. When they come home from school, ask them, how was your day? What came up today? And if they offer what happened, use that teachable moment again. Oh, you know what? This is what we do. This is what we don't do, but don't, <laughs> don't bring up that they're a bad kid. You just told me you don't want them to have that complex. So it's very <laughs> interesting. Once we start talking this through with them and when I, when I hold, so last fall, I had a parent like six week course, one hour a night where I taught the parents this. And then they were able to go and practice that week and bring back the stories of how it worked. Okay. How, how are you doing? What's working? What's not working? And they said that being able to keep this in the forefront of their mind helped them. Sorry for my, if you can hear my alarms going off, uh, it helped them stay focused and remind them to do this with their kids. Like too often we hear something and we're like, okay, 
And then like life happens and we don't really change that behavior. And so whether you're interested in doing like the course again with me, or that's why I recorded it. So parents could watch it whenever they want, because just bringing it back to your forefront will help you stay and check in with yourself. Oh yeah. Today, did I say anything to my child? How did I say it? Oh, how could I say that differently? Or simply using that question. What's up with that? And then sometimes the kids shrug their shoulders and they're like, I don't know. That's their, that's their default. I don't know. And I love saying this to them, teaching parents this as well. I know you don't know, but if you did know, what would you say? And sometimes I add, there's no right or wrong answer because they're so calculating what they think they want us to hear from them and know truly. I mean, one kid barreled his way into the first grade class, uh, like a year or two ago. And the teacher was like calling me, like he just had knocked a kid over, like, what is his problem? He's not ready to come in this class. So I sat in the hall with him because he was now crying because he was in trouble. And I just sat with him, waited for him to get calm. And then I said, you know, I noted, or I heard that you kind of like ran into the classroom and like, back the kid, like, what's up with that? And then he starts to tell me about his morning that morning where he didn't get to finish his breakfast. His dad kind of yelled at him. They had to run out the door and he was just an upset little mess and came in with that. And that's how it presented itself, running into the classroom, barreling through everything. And so then we were able to like, okay, do you need something to eat? Okay, what can we do to make this right with the kid that you just ran over? What would you like to say? What like, would you like to go say that now? So you really work with them to really problem solve because when kids misbehave, it's either a problem to be solved or a skill that they haven't been taught yet that sometimes as adults, we assume that they should know that by now. Well, I did teach them. Kids that age already know that. Okay, let's take out the assumption. I invite you to take out the assumption and be curious. Maybe that's something we have to go over and wrote, teach them again. Mm-hmm. Cool. I mean, and even as adults, I mean, we can incorporate these teachings into our, into our lives as well. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a, parents and children both need that personal development, wellness, mindfulness training, and it's, it's an ongoing training. And I think it's just a whole new muscle that we need to activate um, in terms of going internal uh, as well, because we're so focused on the external, and that is what we're conditioned to focus on since our ability to walk and talk. You know, that was the journey to focus on external, and um, and then today's society just gets busier and faster and faster as we progress in technology. Our society is just getting faster. I mean, the skill sets uh, of even last year is now like, you know, you need an upgrade, um, you know, with the rise of new technology, new ways of using technology. Um, so it's really easy just to get caught up in the external and not really pay attention to what's going on internally or even like recognize it. So it is a vital, vital, vital and I, honestly, I think every school should be like teaching this. We should have been taught this. You know, we mm-hmm. would have been much more, there'd be more healthier adults roaming this planet that are, you know, that would actually know how to give themselves joy and happiness to themselves as opposed to feeling like they need to take it from other sources, um, which is a recipe for disappointment like if, you're, if that's your expectation. So um, so thank you so much, Karen, for being on the show and loved, loved the conversation. And again, like I said, I wish I had that training as a kid. I, you know, I think everybody, everyone says the same thing. Um, so where can people find more about you? What, yeah, which- so- you can follow me on my podcast, Momnificent, like you said in the beginning. I also have a YouTube channel uh, that has those podcasts. It's a guesting podcast. So I pulled all kinds of guests, authors, uh, speakers, parents, uh, former heads of school, kids, teachers to really cover topics to help parents in raising their kids. And if you think of another topic you want me to bring to you, just uh, 
go to my educationalimpactacademy.com website and just go to the contact section, contact me. If you're interested to take a course or buy the parent course that I created or work one-on-one to, to get rid of like the things that are holding you back as a mom or, or a parent, sometimes even mom guilt can just be there holding people back and it, it doesn't have to be. Um, and so I've created that to really help train parents because I learned it. And if I can learn it, you can learn it and teachers need to learn it. And it's so disheartening at times that I, when I talk to people, they almost every person has at least one story of a teacher that said something that to this day, they still struggle with what they said. And I don't think it has to be that way. And our kids that are bad at school, it doesn't have to be a trajectory of who they are and who they're going to be the rest of their life. So let's change that and rewrite their story. And this is the way that you can do it. So Mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Karen. Um, Yeah, so that website will be listed in the show notes, guys. And any last words before we close to tell the happy being well audience? Oh, and by the way, guys, I was actually on the Momnificent podcast. Um, So talking about self-care. So if you want to catch that podcast episode, it will be on the Momnificent podcast. Yes, you'll see that there in the next month or so. The last thing I just want to leave each of you with is, is to tell yourself today and really receive this thought that you are enough. Mom, dad, parent, sister, whoever you are listening to this right now, I want you to just stop and really just take in the feeling, that really good feeling that you're enough. And I know you're doing the best you can and the best you know how. And I want you to feel good about that right now. There are a ton of things that you do that don't make us feel so great as a parent, adult, friend, whatever. And I want you to stop and let that feeling fill you of how amazing and awesome it is that you are enough. Mm, Awesome and powerful, powerful words that we all, all, you know, need to remind ourselves of, you know, it's so, so true. All right, guys, it was a pleasure as always, you know, listening to Karen and guys just remember to live happy being well. It's super, super, super important, you know, create Zen in your environment, create Zen in your day-to-day life, uh, release stress in healthy ways, you know, drink water with lemon, uh, drink water with lemon right now, <laughs> you know, just little things make a huge, huge difference. Show love to your body, show love to your mind, show love to your spirit. All right. Until next time, guys. <laughs>